So, so did the, um, the VM scale out make sense just in terms of sort of what the capabilities were and, and just sort of how it differed from storage DRS and what we do there? I think it's an interesting way to approach it. <coughs> it's, a very, it's a different way of doing it with, and still achieve the same outcome. Um, I guess it's, it then comes down to how tightly you can integrate the offloading of the replicas of data between the different boxes and not have to keep depending on the hypervisor to do a lot of that movement. And if you could, you know, move, move a lot of that workload down, that would be even better. But it's a, it's, it's a fascinating approach to do it as a cluster rather than a, a cluster of related devices at a management level rather than a physical level. I think it's quite a good way of doing it. Okay. One way we've talked about this is uh, with this kind of scale-out environment, you can go and deploy 10, 100, 1,000 VMs in this environment without worrying about where you're actually putting them, <coughs> and then allow the system to watch the performance workload, the profile of each of the virtual machines, and decide where to best place it within the number of VM stores. Kind of nice. It's nice when you're doing things at scale, like cloud scale uh, VM deployment. It takes a lot of the pressure off of getting it right the first time. We'll get it right for you. You won't be adding any shelves to the existing. You'd just be going and putting denser media into them. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it just the densities are so high now. Um, and again, the the you need to have some match between performance and capacity. Uh, that you know, if you like, the SSDs are almost like the new shelves, right? I mean, you're you're going to be talking about 32 terabyte SSDs, uh, and then when you add the the uh, dedupe and compression on top of that. It's huge. Trying to think through the economics of adding a shelf of disk versus adding an entire set of controllers and all of those pieces as well. But we do we do support half populated systems, and then you can add additional, um, you know, additional SSDs as well to the environment. Yeah, so you don't have to have the whole whole thing up front. I think just one, one observation. I think you keep coming up with new ideas, which are really great. And then we sit down and look at it and we think, oh, go on, then the next thing, then the next thing. And you've sort of got a never ending job, really, because every time you do something, it, you, we, can, we can see, oh, and if, what happened if we could do that? <laughs> and I, think, I think that's a really positive thing because the first thing that happens is everybody's looking at it and already assimilated it and wants it to be even better than it is, which is, which is good. You know, you can't do everything in one go. So, you know, I, I think the fact that people are saying that's a really positive thing. Good. Good. There you go. That's... I tell people when they come, we have more ideas than time to do them, which is uh, yeah. always the place you want to be. So, so Chris, I, what, I, what I can say is in, in, in a you know, startup or a young company, having an, an infinite amount of ideas and roadmap it is, is a blessing, right? Yeah. Be, being five years into a product and having nothing left to do is not a, not a good place in the industry to be in. So we would we we love having more than we have engineering man hours to do. It's just about prioritization. It's one of the reasons we do something like this with you guys to hear your your feedback and, and find out what is what's relevant to the market, what's most interesting, and float that to the to the top of the list to implement. But we obviously prioritize in terms of you know we work closely with customers you know on both this VM scale out as well as on analytics in terms of prioritizing what's the most important things to them and there's always more stuff um, but you know those are what we prioritize for the follow on follow on releases. How do you migrate into being more application aware? Because you're you're very much talking about yourself being a a VM aware company, which is great for the next few years, but at some stage that will have to change a bit. You know, do you think? you need to become, flash yourself as an application away company? <coughs> well, uh, with the Palo Alto Networks being an application or a firewall company, there's obviously a lot of, lot of interest in, in building oneself as application aware. So that's something I've been thinking of um, as, as sort of my next project, is, is more what we can do at the application aware level. Uh, I can't talk a lot about that because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not done yet, <laughs> um, but certainly I think there there are three main areas there. One is is just better identification of applications. Uh, we talked about right now we're limited to uh, the 
names or folders of the hypervisor. We know a lot of customers use tags. We're been sort of waiting on the vSphere API to get the tags back out of vCenter. Um, there are other things we can do, like look at traffic patterns, look at uh, you know what OS is installed that, that would add some extra dimensions there. Uh, the second thing is then adapting better to what applications are doing. Um, if we know something is an exchange server, what can we do as a storage appliance to make exchange work better? I don't know the answer yet, but there, there's got to be something we could do. And the third thing that's more farther in the future is we could then uh, have applications make use of the rich functionality we've got. Uh, SyncVM is a great example of that. Uh, the self-service restore, if, it, if that was something the guest could initiate and get its own backups, there's a lot of stuff you could do with that. And that's more prosaic things like trim, right? Trim doesn't work through the NFS stack in VMware, but if we could find a side channel to let us clean up the free lists and, and other things that people do with trim that would lead to better utilization of the box. So those are the three things I'm, I'm thinking about, but which of those comes next is, is still something we're discussing. Does that, does that mean you should become more hyper-converged because of that? Does that, does that give you an advantage? I'll, I'll let Kieran do that you, one. Or are you desperately just, just, you know, determined just to be a storage company? Yeah, so, so we, we actually, let, let me say what we have in common with hyper-converged, and then let me say where I disagree with hyper-converged. So what we have in common with hyper-converged is that we both take a VM-centric um, view on things, right? So you, you assume that you have a VM and that you're operating at the, at the VM level. Um, in the hyper-converged case, um, you're actually mixing things at the hardware level, right? So you're, you're combining uh, the storage and the compute together. We don't think that's a good idea, okay? We don't think it's a good idea um, uh, we don't think it's a good idea for the data center. Um, it it can, can be a reasonable idea at the, the small branch office level, um, but from a performance perspective and also from the fact that compute can grow at a, in a different way from storage, um, we don't think that's the right way to, to approach it. Um, but we do agree with the, the notion of infrastructure kind of going away in, or becoming kind of more uh, invisible or so, sort of not being visible at the application level. And so, um, you know, we do agree with the, the model of, um, you know, looking at servers um, as well as looking at, at storage, <coughs> but not necessarily combining those as a, uh, as a single, single unit. 